with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Say welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study. I are ready to start a new book today, Book of Joel. Joel is written just to a time, a, a time address, that is to say, just before the day of the Lord. So it becomes a very important book to you today because it gives you a picture, if you would, of how things will be just before the Lord's Day, which is to say just before the first day of the millennium, which means that Within that time, Satan, his army, and what some of the nations will be doing. Also, the day of Pentecost hinges on the book of Joel considerably. Inasmuch as Peter would say, this is that that was spoken by Joel the prophet. So if you want to know, rather than the tongue they were speaking, or I should say plural, tongues, then Joel tells you what they said. And that's very important. We'll go into that a little bit in chapter 2. But now comes chapter 1. The word Joel means Yahweh is God. He's, um, and um, there is no other. That's it, all wrapped up with a ribbon on it. There is no other God. And um, with that having been said, chapter 1, verse 1, and it reads... Uh, the word of the Lord that came to Joel, the son of Pethuel, which is to say the vision of, vision of God. Now, I think it's very important that you notice whose word this is. You can't say it's Joel's word any more than that that is spoken of by Joel the prophet on Pentecost Day was man, but it was the word of God. In other words, the pen of Joel, yes, but God's word. When God says it, that's it. That's the way it is, and it will come to pass exactly as it's written. Verse 2, hear this, ye old men. That means you elders that have a little gray hair and supposed to have a little smart about you. And give ear, you listen carefully. All ye inhabitants of the land, hath this been in your days, or even in the days of your fathers? The story I'm about to tell you, the Father says, you will not have seen it come to pass in prior history. And I can tell you it has not come to pass to this day. But it is the Antichrist, his army, and events that God's election shall be doing. That's why it is such an important story. And it's so easy to mark uh, the events because there's never been anything happened like it before. And as I stated, certainly not to this time. Verse 3, tell ye your children of it. You keep this going along, pass it. And let your children tell their children and their children another generation, umbilical cord to umbilical cord, until it comes to pass. And that will be de facto the seventh trump and the day of the Lord. Verse 4, that, this is the story, that which the palmer worm hath left hath the locust eaten, and that which the locust hath, uh, hath left hath the canker worm eaten, and that uh, which the canker worm hath left hath the caterpillar eaten. Now, that may sound a little confusing, but that is simply, it's simply one creature, the locust. And it gives four stages of the locust life. It's very important, the stages, as far as that's concerned, because it gives you the base or the formulation of how things come to pass. This will be no different than the great locust army that is spoken of in Revelation chapter 9. So it will not be new to you. But it certainly hasn't happened yet. The Hebrew is rather poetic in, in as much as it gives you the four uh, stages,
because it goes, um, there is the nar, and what the nar leaves, the nar's remnant will eat, and the, what the, the nar's remnant, the swarmers will uh, eat, and the swarmer's remnant, the devourer shall eat, the devourer's remnant shall the consumer eat. Still all one locust, but a little poetic in the Hebrew. Verse 5. Awake ye drunkards and weep. Do you know what a drunkard is? That's somebody that's perhaps think of, have you ever known an alcoholic? I mean somebody that has it bad and all, every time you see them, they're drunk. They're out. But it's saying, hey, shake yourself awake here, drunkard, and weep and howl, all ye drinkers of wine, because of the new wine, for it is cut off from your mouth. In other words, you better start wake up and start sobering up because there's nothing else to drink. You have been stripped clean bare. I don't have to tell you how wine is made. It comes from the vine. There are no more vines. And by the time they sober up, it's going to be a long time uh, pressing out a new crop. All right? That requires work. What a sad day that's going to be. But it's going to happen. And quite frankly, if you think this does not pertain to spiritual, uh, in a spiritual sense, you're mistaken. By the time some people wake up and realize they are so steeped in traditions, they're going to find out that they have been um, asleep or in a stupor well enough, just like a hangover from bad wine or bad drink or strong drink. Verse 6, for a nation is come up upon my land. There's a conspiracy is what he's saying. Strong and without number, whose teeth are the teeth of a lion, and he hath the cheek teeth of a great lion. And that, again, has to do with Revelation chapter 9, where it states uh, he kills like a lion. So we know we're not talking about locust, all right? It's simply that they are, um, because of their destructive force, that is to say, everything green before them is stripped bare. But that's what the nation, that is to say, Satan's one world little system when it comes to fulfillment, by the time people wake up, there will be no commodity left that has not been touched. So you had better stay spiritually attuned to your Father's Word. You will have no excuse because the book of Joel lets you know exactly how it will build and how it will come to pass. Verse 7. He hath laid waste my vine. He hath laid my vine waste, rather. What, what is God's vine? It's Israel. God's children, and barked my fig tree. He hath made it clean bare. I mean, it's white. When, when that locust army hit it, they took everything, even the bark off the tree, and cast it away. The branches thereof are made white, being clean bare. Well, you know, the family tree, there it goes. It is amazing to me that people let their heritage slip away in the way they do and take no interest whatsoever in that that has been, but only look forward to that that sh is and shall come. Why? Because of lack of faith or even knowledge uh, concerning our Father's plan of salvation, our Father's plan of uh, bringing a order to this world where there shall be no more pain or hurt. But one must care enough about the Father to at least communicate with him. Because you can rest assured, he said this will come to pass, and in a spiritual sense, it will. And if you have eyes to see and ears to hear, look around you today. 
how much spiritual life do you actually see? If you would rather have a, a more humanistic viewpoint of this rather than a, a creature, such as a locust utilized, look at Ezekiel chapter 37 of the Valley of the Dry Bones. The people weren't dead physically, they were dead spiritually because what brought them back to life? Preaching, prophecy. And one bone came to another. In other words, they began to live a little bit when God's truth, His Word, was um, loosed upon them. So here we see the condition that the locust will bring upon the land. Verse 8, Lament like a virgin girded with sackcloth for the husband of her youth. Boy, what a statement that is. Number one, at least she's still a virgin. She won't be like that one mentioned in Mark chapter 13, verse 17, where Jesus would say, Woe to that one that is with child and giving suck when I return in a spiritual sense, meaning that she has already wed another and is not a virgin left to participate in my uh, wedding. And that given in a spiritual sense so that you can understand. Naturally, the emotions as well. God is a jealous God. But do you know what happens when you gird yourself up? You're ready to do battle. And use the sackcloth if you must, but be ready. As it's written there, I can think of another place that Paul would teach in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, along about verse 3. He said, I'm really afraid Satan's going to deceive you just like he deceived Eve, and you're going to lose your virginity. That's the subject. It's given in a spiritual sense? Yes. He said, you get these, Paul, it continues in that 11th chapter. You have one of these super preachers come along, and you swallow what they say hook, line, and sinker, not documenting it from God's Word as to how your father says it will be. Well, I've got some news for you. As verse 1 stipulated in this book of Joel, this is the Word of God by the pen of Joel, telling you how it will be. It will be no different. Verse 9, the meat offering and the drink offering is cut off from the house of the Lord. The priest, the Lord's ministers, mourn. They do what? They starve for truth. Why? Because all they put out is a bunch of pablum and diaper babies. They give milk. They don't give any meat. It's no wonder that the meat of God's Word is cut off, and very few today have the courage to even speak the truth. Now, that's, that's a, there are, God bless them, good ministers of God's Word in certain places. But on the large part, you're going to get a bunch of one-verse revolving revs that will never get around to teaching the meat of God's Word chapter by chapter and verse by verse, whereby the hearer has the opportunity to learn truth from God's Word. Is it any wonder that truth is cut off when it's never taught? I want you to know it says it's cut off from the house of the Lord. What is that? The church is. Verse 10, the field is wasted, the land mourneth, for the corn is wasted, the new wine is dried up, the oil languisheth. Uh, it's just drip bare. Boy, you, you know, if you've ever seen uh, a flight of locusts before and after, you would really have the picture here. Verse 11, be ye ashamed, O ye husbandmen. That means you farmers. Howl, O ye vine dressers, for the wheat and for the barley, because the harvest of the field is perished. Who did God create to be the husbandman? He created the six day generation, He rested the seventh. He looked around on the eighth, and he had no man to till the garden. The six-day man, he gave them instructions to have uh, authority over the animal world, that is to say, be hunters and fishers. And you have generation, um, you have uh, 
Nationality is that basically that's what they are, is hunters and fishers, exactly the way God created them. That is their natural desire and talent. And then he brought along this husbandman that is supposed to be responsible for the field. It would be that particular man, Ha'adam, through which the Savior of Saviors would come, thus important. But where are the vine dressers? They're those that bring forth the truth boldly and straightforward and let the chips fall wherever they may. He said, uh, what he's saying here is they should be a little ashamed that they haven't dressed up the field of God, which is this world, doing what they're supposed to do, keeping the garden in order and taking care of the crops, again in a spiritual sense. Verse 12, the vine is dried up. Those old boys are going to have to wait a long time to get another drink, huh? About time to sober up, even the vines are dead. And the fig tree languisheth, the pomegranate tree, the palm tree also, and the apple tree. Can't even tell any apple jokes of like Eve eating an apple, which is not biblical. The one verse revs won't. I don't know what they'll do when they lose the apple tree. Even all the trees of the field are withered because joy, because what? This gives you the reason, because joy is withered away from the sons of men. Scratch the word men and write Adam. That's what the manuscripts say, the vine dresser, he that is responsible, he that is supposed to take care of it. This goes back to that, um, to that time, preparing you for the day of the Lord, because you can mark it. And look at it spiritually. If you can't do that, you're not going to see it. For the Antichrist himself physically will come in prosperously and peacefully on the land, and there will be plenty. Plenty of everything but truth. That means plenty of lies, plenty of deception, plenty of false teaching. Verse 13, what are you to do about it? Gird yourselves and lament. That, that means you, you've got something to cry about a little bit. Sing a sad song here. Ye priest, howl. Ye ministers of the altar. Come, lie all night in sackcloth, ye ministers of my God, for the meat offering and drink offering is withholden from the house of your God. Well, truth is withholden. Why? How could possibly truth be taught if the so-called even ministers themselves are so steeped in traditions they don't know the truth. The simplicity of God's Word in the way it is written, a child can understand it if you'll be wise enough to simply follow subject and understand a few idioms, metaphors, and figures of speech. That is to say, similitudes, as he would say in the book of Hosea that he sent us, that means uh, when, when you cannot put it together from simply reading it with subject and object, I send similitudes, that is to say, I have people act things out so that you can see it and understand what's going to happen from the act. That is why he would give you the four stages of the locust, so that you would know that Satan eats away in various stages as um, he comes out to, from the hidden into plain sight and grows bolder until the very flashing wings. Have you ever seen a swarm of locusts with the sun hitting behind them? It's like a light flashing, a beautiful play of lights where he comes out and, and is so bold that he does things right before your eyes, but you're, if you are so far away, drifted away from the truth by that time, that, and all you are is stooped, uh, steeped in traditions of men, you wouldn't recognize the negative if it came before you. You'd just say, isn't that pretty? Truth is withholding from the house of God. Is it any wonder, is it any wonder that truth is withholding by those that would teach such things as 
you don't have to understand God's word like the book of Revelation. You're going to be gone. Can, can you imagine the brass? Uh, what word can we use besides idiocy of a so-called man of the cloth that would feel that God didn't know what he was doing and that you, shouldn't, you should ignore God's word and listen to his? Or what would be worse than his idiocy it would be one that would follow him. I'm afraid it happens every day. I don't know how are you doing. What God is saying here with the sackcloth and all this, there's a sad day coming for them. Not for you, not God's anointed, those that see the truth, that see it coming. But for them, there's a sad awakening, like waking up from a long drunk. Now, I can't tell you what it's like to wake up from a long drunk, because I have never in my life been on a long drunk. Now, um, so I know I've seen people that have, and they don't look so good, all right? I mean, they, they look to me like they are in pain and are not happy campers at all. Like, like uh, the lion chewed them up and spit them out because they, they just weren't fit to take in, all right? So see that you're not in that camp. Verse 14, what is he going to tell you to do about it? Sanctify ye a fast. He did not say a feast. He didn't say let's celebrate. A fast. Call a solemn assembly. Gather the elders. That's the people that are supposed to have been taught God's word that should know better. And all the inhabitants of the land into the house of the Lord your God and cry unto the Lord. You better beg for forgiveness. But at the same time, what happens in the Lord's house? What is the message? Do you go there and say, I want to tell you how to get along with your neighbors? I haven't read that yet. I mean, we're a little late to worry about getting along with neighbors with everybody starving. The crops are all gone, spiritually speaking. Now, stick with me. What are you supposed to say? What are you supposed to teach? Naturally, the Word of God. What is His Word? 15. Alas, for the day. Repeat for emphasis so you get the message. For the day of the Lord is at hand. And as a destruction from the Almighty shall it come. Not maybe, not perhaps. It shall come. Hey, you can read of it in Revelation 6, 16, and 17. If some revolving rev hasn't told you, you don't need Revelation. I hope you didn't listen to him. I hope you told him to take it and where to stick it. Because that's what he deserves, to have a little maturity to him. Nonsense. Well, where does he stick it? Back in Satan's mouth. That's where it came from. When somebody tells you you don't have to worry about part of God's word, it's, they're straight from Satan's camp. They heard it from him. Verse 16. I really hope I'm not embarrassing anyone. You know, like revolving revs. I really hope I'm not. But, you know, hey, if it does, then you deserve it. Verse 16. Is not the meat cut off before our eyes? Yea, joy and gladness from the house of our God. You know, the deeper truth, when it is cut off, there is not much to rejoice about. I mean, it looks pretty slim out there. Shallow, nobody's, I mean, boring. If, if you get a one verse, Charlie, that um, has got to tell you about Aunt uh, Sybil and what all she's done and everything and how the Lord smiled upon her, what you want to do is to get God to smile upon you. And why do, how does he do that? When you are strong enough to take the meat after you hear the milk. He doesn't like it when people... Um, 
stick to only milk and pablum over and over and treat uh, children and adults as if they're ignorant and do not have the ability to look at God's word, word in a deeper vein. I give God's children, those that he created, who are extremely intelligent, a little more credit than that. Credit for the ability to know the Lord's day. What is the Lord's day? What does a day mean to the Lord? I don't want you to be ignorant about that. So just to see that you're not, and there I go using that word uh, ignorant again, and you know, I don't want to upset anybody because I wasn't the one that said it, okay? You'll find it in 2 Peter chapter 3, and in verse 8, Paul states, I'm, uh, and um, uh, rather here, uh, Peter states, but beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, if you're ignorant of this one thing, I'm sorry, you probably won't understand. That's what Peter is saying. Don't be ignorant of this one thing. That one day is with the Lord. That is to say, the Lord's day is one day. And that one day with the Lord is as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. Now, do you know what the Lord's Day is? Have you ever heard of a thousand-year period? Let's see, how do, we, how do we say a thousand years? Well, that's a millennium. Oh, heavens, we must be talking about the millennium then. Don't be ignorant of it. That's the time that the millennium begins. And the events that we're reading here, the condition of the church as such, just before that great day of the Lord, the millennium. Well, gee whiz, I didn't know that. Well, it's about time you learned it. If it sounds like I'm talking down, perhaps today I am just a little bit, but it's time we grew up, don't you think? I mean, the price for being deceived is quite extensive in pain and, and anguish, disappointment. You probably, if, if you are in that position, you probably never amounted anything in your life anyway, and you probably had about all the disappointment in life a person needs. So change and get into the meat, be fruitful and blessed of God, whereby you have something to be joyful about and bring joy back into the house of God because God, through him, we have the victory. We've got something to be joyful about and with the gladness too. In other words, what it means is you call a, call a solemn assembly and you begin to teach the deeper truths from God's word and leave uh, those salvation, the milk be the beautiful first step. Let them grow up. Let them mature. 17. The seed is rotten under their clods. The garners are laid desolate. The barns are broken down. They're empty. For the corn is withered, it withered on the stalk, died in the field, as far as truth is concerned. Do you know why? Because the seed was never planted. Well, you know, we shouldn't really, some of, some of the meat of God's word is a little bit on the rough side. You know, and people, we would probably frighten them and it would frighten them out of the church. We don't want a bunch of cowards in the church anyway. What's wrong with you? If they're a bunch of cowards, get rid of them. You don't have to worry about building a congregation in your church if you will only teach God's word. If you will feed those sheep, they will fight to get into your building. But you try to pull a bunch of this, oh, gee, my goodness. The, I, I am your reverend. You are to reverence me. I don't reverence any man, this man or any other man. But I wonder how little David would have been. I mean, let's picture what this will put you in the real world because Christianity is not a religion, it's a reality. Let's take little David. I'm going to give you a similitude. Little David, the whole army is shaking. And David feels sorry for the adults there in the army that don't know any better. So little David marches out and said, please giant, 
I'm a little Jesus boy, and I want you to lay down for me and let me cut your head off. Just be nice about it. I mean, I'm going to pray about this, and I know I won't have to do anything that the Lord will just swoop down and cut your head off for me. I myself am not a man of violence. Do you think David acted that way? Do you think that lad that saved Israel that day and the words from his mouth is a, are, are deep meat. And this is when Jesus would say, out of the mouth of babes. It was out of the mouth of that babe, David, that that scalding message came forth. That if Israel won't help me, all it takes is God and will conquer the world. So it is with his truth, if you have the courage to teach it, to plant that seed rather than let it rot on a shelf in your house to keep names in it of marriages and deaths called the Bible. It's just jam full of fertile seed if you just sow a few. And I thank God for those of you that participate in this ministry because we scatter a bunch of them. We broadcast to the world. And I assure you the seed do not rot under the clod they form into a wonderful blessing for those that participate. How wonderful it is to have your barn full of spiritual knowledge, whereby you know what tomorrow brings, and it chases fear out of your family, whereby you can stand on the true rock and be somebody. Verse 18. How do the beast groan? Groan from what? Hunger. Picture the field, spiritually. The herds of cattle are perplexed because they have no pasture. Yea, the flocks of sheep are made desolate. Oh, the lost sheep of the house of Israel. God didn't lose anybody, but this is why Jesus would say in that great book of Matthew, Go but to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. To feed that sheep, they would bring in others. But I'm going to tell you something. As a husbandman, a farmer, or a rancher, it isn't a very pleasant thing to hear the bleat of uh, hungry animals, starving animals, or starving people either. It's too bad that people, when they're starving spiritually, cannot give out that same death throw cry of hunger for the real word of God, for real truth, something that'll stick to their ribs and give them the eternity. I guarantee you one thing, when they hear it, they know it. They know it as a gift from God of seed planting of his word. I don't like to hear their groans, and I suppose that's why I try so hard to teach his word. And I thank God that I have such an arm of... Uh, a Christian army that helps me to teach those words. 19, O Lord, to thee will I cry, for the fire hath devoured the pastures of the wilderness. You know, and that's what locusts, I tried to describe it earlier, look like. Their wings look like fire when the sun plays on them in the morning with the green pastures in front of them. And the flame hath burned all the trees of the field. The locusts simply, simply strip it. And the one world system controlled by the Kenites does the same thing. It strips everything from before people's eyes and they don't know it. Verse 20, the beast of the field cry also under thee. That's to say the living creatures. For the rivers of waters are dried up and the fire hath devoured the pastures of the wilderness. Oh, we're, we're really a clean lot. I understand that one of the great lakes up north now that they've found, what was it, PCBs or something of that nature, some chemical in the water where the fish are not even edible anymore. Pollution. It's real sad. Well, know this. Your father loves you. Your father wants you to know what it's like just before the Lord's Day. He's given you a picture of it. And I'm going to tell you something. Many might say, well, I'm doing pretty good. I don't know that times are hard or anything like that. Oh, 
Well, let's see. Let's say that a man pays 100000 for a house in this system. Oh, yes, I have a home, and I, I, I didn't even have to pay anything down, hardly. And they allow me to make payments. Uh, let's see now. Well, the, uh, they gave it to me at 10%. Well, let's see. 10% of 100000 is 10000 10000 a year. You have the privilege. You, you do. You have the privilege of working uh, all year long together, together, $10,000. And yeah, I, even, I even got 11000 last year. That means you paid them 10000 and you got one for yourself off your principal. Aren't you the lucky one? Oh, my. You're, you're doing good, all right, aren't you? Yes. Well, get out of usury when you can. I tell you, it is sad when you see what has happened when we drift away from God's law that is against usury it, with the exception of the fact of using it to make your and provide for your family, such as a car you might have to get back and forth to work. But keep it, I mean, put a vice grip on it and tighten it every day to make certain that you don't stay a prisoner of a system of usury. Yeah, it's not bad. We're blessed. But it can be a lot better when you're wise enough to see the picture God has painted for you and have the wisdom to recognize the tricks of Satan's trade to take away a person's freedom and even when they call themselves free at times. Think about it. Like I said, we got a long ways to go. And hey, if you're already getting too weak, well, you're probably not going to make it. But with God's strength, you, we not only are going to make it, We've got the victory. Don't miss any of these lectures in Joel. It tells you what it's like just before the millennium. And you know something? Uh, it looks a lot like it looks around today. So it might be that it was written to you. I can guarantee it was because God wrote it. He sent that word to his children and you happen to be one. Don't miss the next lectures. All right, bless your heart. You listen a moment, won't you please?